All right. I would like to start off today by asking the Christians a few questions. Did Yeshua, that's the guy that the Christians call Jesus, did Yeshua come to save all who are lost? Are you sure? What if he only came for the Yehudim? What if he only came for the Jews? Would that mean that the going, the Gentiles are goners? Did you know that Yeshua actually told his Talmudim, his disciples, not to preach the gospel to the going, the Gentiles? I also told them not to heal their sick when uh, he sent them out. He, he really did. In Levi, that's what the Christians call Matthew, chapter 10, verses 5 through 6. This is my translation of the Greek text. These 12 Yeshua sent forth and commanded them, saying, Do not go to the way of the going, and do not go into any town of Shomronim. That's the Samaritans. Shomronim, the Samaritans, those are the half-Jews. Don't go to the Gentiles, and don't go to the half-Jews. But go, rather, he said, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Here we see a clear picture of what Yeshua came to do. He came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He came to the Jews, all the Jews, and no one but the Jews. Is it possible that he didn't care about the going, about the Gentiles? Well, I don't know. Maybe he had something against people who ate pork or shrimp or lobster or something. Is it possible that the term lost sheep of the house of Israel is a metaphor for something else? What if it is? What if it isn't? The name of this message is Lost Sheep and Yapping Little Chihuahuas. Please stand and cover yourselves for the reading of our scripture. <laughs> for those of you who do not know, I am tethered. That means I've got wires tied down to me if i move i'll probably get shocked very sternly and that will not be pleasant for me or you as i'll be screaming into the microphone <laughs> anyway it is not a command that we stand up it's not a command that we cover ourselves it's just something that our lord did all of his disciples did and all their disciples did so it's something that we do in honor of that our verse today is from yermiyahu that's jeremiah Chapter 50, verse 6, and it says, Zon ovdo haya ani roehem hit on harim shove vim mehar el giv a ha alahu halahu rather shach hu riv zam. All right, so you may be seated. Now we begin with zone. Zone is a t t z. Zone. Most people only hear the Z, but there's a TZ sound there. It means sheep. It's flocks of small cattle, by the way. And the small cattle are what they call sheep and goats. <laughs> Rarely used only of sheep, though. They're always talking to, when they talk about a herd of sheep or a flock of sheep, there's usually goats intermingled with them. The next word is odot. Lost. It's to be lost, to lose oneself, to wander, especially use of a lost and wandering sheep, of lost and wandering sheep, uh, to flee away in the desert as a wild beast and there to disappear, as it were. Used of men, it is also used of things such as rivers which disappear into the desert, metaphorically of wisdom failing. Your wisdom has disappeared. To perish, to be destroyed, used of men and other living creatures as perishing. Also used of a land and houses which are laid waste, metaphorically of hope, wishes, desires which are frustrated, to be ready to perish, to be wretched and unfortunate. All of that we get from the word lost. Our next word is haya, which is to be, to exist. Now, when this word is followed by lamed, it is to be to anyone used of a thing. In other words, for him as the possessor to be possessed. We're not talking about demons here. <laughs> to be 
for anything, to serve for or as anything. Uh, none of this is really important. The primary notion is of existence, which comes from that of living, applied to breathing, uh, blowing of breath in and out, which has partly been applied to the meaning of breathing after, desiring, rushing headlong, partly to that of living and existing. It really is just it, the word is, I-S, it is. It will be. It was. It's all of those things. It's existence. So our next word is Ami. The word is actually Am, and then they say Ami, which literally means people, me, because in Hebrew they say things correctly. In English, we would say my people, because we say it backwards. Anyway, a people so-called from their being collected together of a single race or tribe, a family, use of relatives. It is opposite to princes, leaders, or the king. It denotes the citizens, the common people, opposite to their leaders. When an individual speaks, my people is the people to which I belong, also of the whole human race, poetically used of a troop, herd of animals. What are they saying? Well, they're saying that we can call ourselves a people if we're calling ourselves Americans. Because here in America, which is where I am and those who are in the room with me, we are Americans, so that makes uh, people in that we are Americans. But we also can split that down to uh, I am an Italian American, I am a Jewish American, I am an African American, I'm a whatever, right? Because we're connecting more specifically to our heritage or our lineage, our parentage, you know. So, uh, or we can say that we're a people because. We all believe in following the Torah. That would make us a people. There just has to be a commonality of some sort. Then it says Roahim, which is literally shepherds they, or their shepherds. So it's to feed a flock, to pasture, to tend and figuratively to guard, to care for, to rule, properly to have the sense of looking upon, to look upon with pleasure, to pasture a flock, properly to look after, to behold, figuratively, to pasture is used for to govern, to rule, or a prince of a teacher of virtue, used of God, of kings and princes, of a teacher of virtue and wisdom, to nourish, to feed, to feed as a flock, of a place where a flock is fed, to delight in any person or thing, to delight in anyone, to be his companion, to seek after something. This, this is a verb. This is not a noun. It's certainly not a proper noun. All right, so then our next word is heat on, go astray, to err, to wonder, to go astray, to wander through or over, metaphorically used of palm branches, of drunken men who go astray through drink, used of the mind which wanders from the path of virtue and piety. In other words, it wanders from the path of Torah. And that is what they call to perish. If you wander from the path of Torah, you perish. God's not willing that anyone should perish. He's not willing that anyone wander from the path of Torah. Our next word is harim. It means mountains um, of a mountainous country. They really are talking of mountains. And nouns are just nouns. There's, there's no... Big hidden secrets here. Uh, then it says, turned away them. It says, shovevim, turned away them. Or they, turn, they are turned away, or being turned away. It's a falling away. It's being rebellious. It's from the root shuv. It is to turn about. It's also used to return, metaphorically, to be converted. Of a non to observant person, a sinner, followed by another verb to return and do or to return to do anything is the same as to do again, to repeat something. Figuratively used, to turn oneself to any person or thing. In other words, you use it to turn yourself to Yahweh. To turn oneself followed by the word mean, the Hebrew word mean, is to cease from, to leave off anything, as to turn from evil. So to turn from evil means you've stopped committing the evil. To turn from sin means you've stopped committing the sin. To turn from anger 
is to stop being angry. If it's followed by the word the all, it's to turn oneself away from anyone, especially in the use of Yahweh. So to return in uh, it's to return into the possession of anyone to recover it. So I you know, somebody left their sunglasses at the Walmart, you happen to know the person saw that they walked off without them, you snatch them up and you run out and you return them to the person who owns them. Generally, to turn oneself anywhere where one was not before. It is often applied to inanimate things, to return, to be restored to a former owner, to be restored or renewed. In a bad sense, to be again turned, to become void, used of a command, a prophecy. Anger is said to return when it is appeased. Uh, this is the idea of backsliding. It is to turn away from Yahweh and to return to Torah rebellion. So you turn away from Yahweh is to live in sin, in other words. Have I ever mentioned what sin is to any of you? <laughs> in case I haven't, in First Yohanan, for the Christians, this is First John. Chapter 3, can you see that? 3, verse 4. First John, this is New Testament, in case you haven't caught this. First John, chapter 3, verse 4. It says this, everyone who commits sin is also in rebellion of the Torah. Because sin is Torah rebellion. Sin is Torah rebellion. We pick back up with Mehar. We've already had this word. It's for mountains. And this is El, which is to or toward. Giva, it's a hill. So they turn from the mountain to a hill. They've gone from a very high place to a not so high place. Then this is Halahu, which is gone day, or they've gone. It's to walk. To go along, but this word is used of boundaries. Uh, to have conversation with somebody, to go after anyone, to follow after, to worship. So if you say you're following God, that means you worship God, right? To walk is to live, to follow any manner of life. So if you're following God, you're living out the same lifestyle that God lives out. Most This is really, truly lost on the Western world, Jews and Gentiles alike. The Torah, Torah observance, that is God's lifestyle. That's why the Jews call it the grace of God. God told us how he lives, and if we will live the way he lives, we will go through this world uh With the, uh, what am I trying to say? It doesn't mean the bad things aren't going to happen to us in this world. It doesn't mean that truly awful things aren't going to happen to us. But what it will mean is that we will always know what the right thing is, and we will always follow after that right thing. Because sometimes the right thing is really rough. But that's what living God's way does. We don't have to go home and say, God, I wish I hadn't said that. Man, if only I hadn't done that. See, if you live God's lifestyle and do it God's way, you'll never have that regret. Uh, especially to go away to banish, hence to decease or to die, it is to go as to water, as water flows or is poured out. But these are boundaries within which we live our lives. It is our walk, the way we live our lives. So that's what the Torah is all about. It is not a jail to keep us in a cell. It's a set of, it's like walking between a set of fences on each side. If you stay on this path, there's this fence, see? And if you don't go over the two, you know, past that fence on the left and you don't go past that fence to the right, you just stay on this path. And you will be doing all, at all times, you'll be doing the right thing. Regardless of whether it's hard or easy, that won't matter. At least you know you've done the right thing. 
but it's when you wander off of that path and go past those boundaries that we get ourselves in trouble and enter into Torah rebellion. Our next word is shahu, which is forgotten they, or they have forgotten, it's to forget, to leave something from forgetfulness. Men are said to forget God, it's an idiom. In other words, they don't live by God's law. When they say you've, for, you've forgotten your God, it means you're not living by his law anymore. Then it says Rebzam, which is resting places. It's a couch. They call it a couching place for flocks. It's a place where they lay them down. Uh, it's a place where you go to rest. Where you go lie down on a couch. You go lay down on your bed. You're a place, you know, a comfortable place is what you're supposed to imagine here. It's a place where it's comfortable and the nice breeze blowing or it's nice, the temperature is nice and everything about it's supposed to be nice, right? But they've forgotten that. Here's my amplified translation in case you've forgotten. It's Yumiyahu, Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 6. My people have become lost, wandering with their wisdom failing. They are laid waste, losing hope and lacking desire. Those who tend, guard, care, and rule over them, those who teach them and are their companions, their shepherds, have caused them to wander, staggering from a path of virtue and piety to idol worship. They have turned and converted them to rebellion on the mountains. They are walking out their lives from a mountain to a hill. They have forgotten their resting place. Okay, here's the regular translation that'll make some sense. Again, it's Yomiyahu, Jeremiah. Chapter 50, verse 6. My people have been a perishing flock. Their shepherds have caused them to wander on the mountains, causing them to turn from the mountains to the hills. They have forgotten their resting place. Their shepherds caused them to be lost. Their shepherds did. How? False doctrine. From unqualified teachers behind the pulpit. Greedy. Arrogant, self-promoting men more interested in money and numbers than truth. Men more interested in maintaining the status quo of whimsical, nonsensical, ear-tickling doctrine that excites the masses to give more money. That's exactly what it was like for Yermiah, whose life, where he lived, his time. Sound familiar? In Levi or Matthew chapter 15, verses 20 through 2 through 28. Matthew 15, 22 through 28. This is my translation of the Greek. And a woman coming from the coast of Canaan, in other words, she was a Gentile, cried out saying, Have mercy on me, Lord Mashiach. What she actually said was Lord, son of David, right? She said, Adon, probably Adonai, Ben David. Don't really know for sure. The Greek's not clear on that. But she said, Lord, son of David, which is an idiom, Lord, Messiah. If you're calling him the son of David, in his time period, they're calling him the Messiah. She said, my daughter is severely demon possessed. But he answered her not a word. Then came his Talmudim, urging him, saying, send her away, for she cries out after us. Lord, send her away. She's making a scene. Let's look at some standout words in verse 24 before I read the translation. He basically says, I am not apostolain. You're apostle there? Apostolain, that's apostle. Apostolone. I am not sent. It's the Hebrew word shalach. Shalach. You should. To sin, to send anyone to do anything, to send anyone to anyone of a person sent, often omitted. In Genesis 31, 4, it says, he sent and called Rachel, Rachel. In other words, he sent someone who brought Rachel, Rachel. Especially anyone is said to send words to another. In other words, to inform by messenger to dismiss, to let go, to send out, to stretch out as a finger, as done in derision, a rod, a sickle, to put it to the corn, to put a sickle to the corn, especially the hand in a hostile sense to force anyone. 
he was not sent to everyone. He said, I am not sent but to probata. That's the Greek word. It's so the sheep, the little cows. <laughs> then it says, Apololota, lost. It's from our word avad. That's to be lost, to wander, especially to be lost into the desert and never be seen again. Then it says, so he's looking for the lost sheep from the oikau, from the bait, the bayit, the house. What house? Israel, the house of Israel. Here's the somewhat amplified translation. And then he answered and said, I am not reaching out except to those who are lost, wandering laid waste and hopeless of the flocks of the house of Israel. Here's my regular translation of Livy. That's Matthew 15, 24. But he answered saying, I am not sent, but to the non-Torah observant. That's the lost sheep, Yehudim. I am not sent, but to the non-Torah observant Jews. The house of Yisrael, that's the Jews. The house of Yisrael are the Jews. He was not sent to the Torah observant Jews. He was sent to the non-Torah observant Jews. Yeshua just said that he only came to save the lost Jews. He did not come here to help the Gentiles. The most profound message here is that Mashiach is not for the Torah observant. He is for the lost. The lost are not the Gentiles. The lost are the Jews who do, who do not live according to their covenant with God, either because they have forsaken God and openly live like the Gentiles, or because they have forsaken the meat's vote of God and live by the meat's vote. Those are the commandments, the laws of men. It's one of those two. Let's go to 25. But she came and worshipped him, saying, Adon, she probably said Adonai, help me. But the word is just Lord, so I give it Adon. But she came and worshipped him, saying, Adon, help me. And he answered, saying, now listen carefully, it is not proper. It is not right. It is not fair. It is not something that God will do to take the gift of healing, by the way, that's the children's bread, to take the gift of healing from the Yehudim, the children of the Yehudim, the Jews, and cast it to the Kelavim, to the dogs. It is not proper to take the gift of healing that belongs to the Jews and give it to the Gentiles. Let's look at Kelavim. It's from Caleb, or Caleb, yes, the name Caleb means dog. It's a dog, so called from barking, the yapping and incessant noise of wild and uncontrolled dogs. In the east, packs of fierce wild dogs often wandered around the towns and villages. Hence, fierce and cruel men were called dogs. Dogs are also unclean animals. So by the way of reproach, anyone is called a dog, a dead dog, a dog's head in the Bible. Gentiles were also called dogs as being uncircumcised and thus disobedient to the laws of God. Do you hear this? They were called dogs because they were uncircumcised. And if they were not circumcised, they were not obedient to the laws of God. That's why the Gentiles were called dogs. Now, yes, he's talking to a woman, but she's a Gentile. So just in uh, that's why the Gentiles are called dogs, but even if the woman is a Gentile, she's still going to be called a dog because the point is they're in disobedience of God's law. The Greek text actually says little dogs, thus yapping little chihuahuas. I might have added the chihuahua part. 
If giving the provision for the children to the dogs, to the Gentiles, was not proper, you can bet your bottom dollar that Yeshua would never give it to this woman or any other dog. There are no circumstances where this would happen. God doesn't change. If it was improper before the cross, it will be improper until the end of time and far beyond it. It will always be improper. And God will not do anything improper. But look at this. And you will serve Yahweh your God, and I will bless your bread. Your bread. The children's bread. I will bless your bread and your water and take away sickness. So what's the blessing of bread and water, by the way? It's the taking away of sickness. Do you see the idiom here? It's an idiom being explained. I will take away the sickness. That's the children's bread from the midst of you. Exodus 23, 25. Healing is a promise for the Yehudim, for the Jews, not to the going. It is not to the Gentiles. Because before all of that, it's talking about you got to live by the law. And if you live by the law, this is what will happen. Thus, it is improper to take the blessing that belongs to the followers of Torah and give them to someone who does not live according to it. Verse 27. And she said, yeah, but God won't really mind because, you know, I'm, no, she's, it's, it's as in she said, and yet the Kelavim, the dogs, the Gentiles, eat the crumbs that fall from their Adon's table. It's so subtle, but so incredible what this woman just said. We read it and say, ah, see, the Gentiles should get the least of the crumbs. And that's not what she said. This woman just declared that she is not a dog sitting at the table of a Gentile, but is a dog sitting at the table of a Jew, and thus a proselyte, a convert to Judaism. She is in the process. Do you hear it now? And she said, and yet the Kelavim, the dogs, eat the crumbs that fall from their Lord's table. If you are eating the crumbs that fall from a Gentile's table, you get the bread of the children of the Gentiles, right? But if you eat the crumbs that fall from the table of a Jew, are you getting it? I hope so. Then Yeshua answers, verse 28, Then Yeshua answered and said to her, Oh, woman, great is your Torah observance. That's what faithfulness is to them. Be it to you as you desire. And her daughter was freed from demon possession the rest of her life. See, what it says is, and her daughter was healed from that very moment. And most people don't realize that that, oh, and, you know, he just as soon as he said it, it happened. Oh, yes, that's true. But healed from that moment means she was never repossessed. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't help but go there. <laughs> the proselyte woman obviously understood who she was and that to which she was entitled. She was only asking for the crumbs that fell to the proselytes, knowing that these crumbs would be more than enough to heal her child. Thus, for a goey, for a Gentile, just living off the crumbs that fell from her Yehudi, her Jewish master's table, how incredible was it that she understood all of this? In short, this woman's knowledge of Torah was way beyond that of crumbs. Yeshua only came for the lost sheep. He didn't come for the yapping little chihuahuas. Yet when yapping little chihuahuas become Torah observant, in other words, they convert to Judaism, even they get a few crumbs here and there until they are able to sit at the table. Yapping little chihuahuas don't get to be part of the covenant. It is not even proper for them to receive the smallest of gifts. Yeshua said it, not me. The English text in verse 28 is so horribly translated that it leaves the Western reader with a terrible image of how things work. It says, great is your faith. 
but there's no such thing as faith in the Bible. The word faith isn't in the Tanakh, which is called the Old Testament by the yapping little Chihuahuas, the Goim, the Gentiles. In Shaul's, the guy they call Paul, in Shaul's letter to the Galatians, he mentions not once but twice that if anyone taught anything other than the gospel that the Shelechim, that the apostles, had given them, that person was to be cursed. In other words, his teaching was false. The gospel that the Shelechim, the apostles, brought came directly out of the Tanakh. The letters they wrote to the first century synagogues, not to churches, were written from Jewish rabbis to Jewish rabbis concerning matters of the Jewish life and religion, which included things written concerning yapping little chihuahuas who were in the process of converting to Judaism. The word faith does not belong in the letters of the Shelechim, the letters of the apostles, the New Testament. Change it to faithfulness every time you see it. Otherwise, you will never understand what it means. Let me give you some examples. It wasn't about what the woman believed. It was about what she did. She didn't give up. It's not for the dogs. Yeah, but I'm a dog sitting at a Jewish table. She didn't give up. It wasn't about what the mustard seed believed. Mustard seeds don't believe anything. It was about what the mustard seed did. It just kept growing. It wasn't about what the lady with the unjust judge believed. It was about what she did. She wouldn't let it go. It wasn't about what the lady with the issue of blood believed. It was about what she did. She kept going to healers until she found the great physician. It wasn't about what Capa, what Peter believed when he stepped out on the water. It was about what he quit doing that caused him to go for a swim that day. He stopped walking and he sank. Yeshua said, oh, you of little faithfulness, not of little faith, little faithfulness. This was a Jewish way. If you speak the Hebrew language, you would totally get this. This was a Jewish way of saying, Kepa, Peter, why didn't you just keep walking? Some people teach that the church has drifted recklessly, even dangerously off course. So is this true? Yes, it is. Some say the church participates in paganism and idol worship. Is this true? Yes, it is. When Yeshua walked the earth, every observant Yehudim, every observant uh, Yehudi, rather, every observant Jew paid 21% of their increase in tithe before they made their offerings, as according to the Hebrew Bible. Yes, there's more than just one tithe in the Bible. Less than 2% of those who claim to be Christians pay a full 10% of their increase, and most of those include their offerings as part of their tithes. Religious Yehudi, religious Jews of the first century, rested every Friday evening at sundown until Saturday evening at sundown, including Yeshua, his Talmudim, his disciples, and all who followed after them until a goi, until a Gentile by the name of Constantine, changed things in the early 300s CE. In fact, all who believed in the Shiach celebrated all of God's holidays and not one pagan holiday, that is, until Constantine. The church does not have Hebraic or Jewish roots. This is a false teaching. Christianity was born out of a desire to pull every religion in the world except, of course, Judaism, under one universal, or should I say, Catholic religion. The word Catholic is the Latin word that means universal. Jewish rabbi, Jewish rabbis, and Jewish doctors of the law were not consulted in this endeavor. Instead, Hellenized pagan philosophers took the Jewish Bible and the letters written by the Talmudim, by the disciples, who followed after Yeshua and perverted the Jewish teachings and religion in order to make it acceptable to those who hated the Jews, Constantine being the chief hater of the Jews. Over 80% of all Americans claim to be Christians, but do not attend church more than one or two times a year, if that, if at all. 
Surely we all know in our heart of hearts that the world is full and filled full with hypocrites. And that per capita, the church probably ranks at or near the top of the hypocrisy meter. So who are the lost sheep of the house of Israel? It is, is it a metaphor for Hellenized pagan philosophy-based religion that rejects God's law and lives by the doctrine of rebellion called grace? Is that even possible? No. The lost sheep of the house of Israel are the non-Torah observant Yehudim, the non-Torah observant Jews, who lost their way because of teachers who perverted the lies of man's law, who perpetuated, I should say, the lies of man's law over God's. They are the children of Israel who know the law, the Torah of God, but don't live according to it. He doesn't just come for those who were here in that short time period. He didn't just come for them, for the people who were here when he came in the first century. He came for all Jews, all the lost Jews, past, present, and future. Consider this. It had been more than 400 years since God sent fire down from heaven to consume the sin sacrifice. According to most first century documents, the vast majority of the Jews were not living according to Torah. Why would they? No matter what they did or did not do, the fire and thus forgiveness of their Torah rebellion, of their sin, wasn't coming down. Doesn't it sound familiar to at least some of the Christians here? Would you obey a God who didn't forgive your sins? In an attempt to keep Judaism alive, the Parashim, the Pharisaic sect of the Jews developed an oral law to live by. Many of the Jews lived by that same law in place of the written Torah to this very day. It's called the Mishnah. Most of them believe that if they keep the oral law, they will not break the written. But this is not true. Much of the oral law is written in complete violation of the written. They remind me of the Christians who know everything there is to know about being a Christian, but don't live it. To be a child of Israel, you would either have to be an actual descendant of Abraham, or you would have to be grafted into his family tree, which would mean that you have converted to Judaism or your family before you did, and they raised you according to the Torah. So, do the Christians have to become Jews? Well, let's take a look at something from the Seferim Shelehim, from the New Testament. We find it in Maasim, that's acts, that's works, that's deeds, that's legalistic stuff. Oh, I'm sorry, it's the book of Acts, chapter 15, verses 1 through 28. This is my translation of the Greek text. Verse 1, and some came from Yehuda, that's Judea, teaching the Torah observant ones, the brothers, unless they be circumcised after the custom of Moshe, they cannot be redeemed. Unless they are circumcised, they cannot be redeemed. And Shaul and Barnaba had no small dispute and controversy with them. So it was determined that Shaul and Barnaba and some of the others should go to Yerushalayim uh, to the Shalichim and the Zike, they needed to go to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about the question. So then indeed, being escorted to the Adah, to the congregation, they passed through Tamar and Shomron, declaring the conversion. Now, they're on their way to Jerusalem to settle the matter. They go through these two places, Tamar and Shomron. Shomron, that's Samaria. They go through these places, and they are declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, causing great joy to all the Torah observant ones, the brothers. The conversion. Given that Catholicism did not exist until the early to mid-300 CE, and that Christianity came in the 1500s, was just to split off of Catholicism, 
it should be noted here that the Gentiles were converting to Judaism. All right, I want to talk to you about something real quick. What I have here uh, is one of two volumes of Eusebius, the work of Eusebius. He is called the official church historian. He's the first person to write a church history. That's what they say now. They wouldn't have said that back then because the church didn't exist. So in his, what I have, what this is, I got a PDF of the actual writing, and then I printed it out in big print so that I could read it because, oh, I wouldn't believe how small the original was. <laughs> In this, he said, he's in his introduction, he says, By this means, moreover, the real antiquity and divine character of, uh, the word is Christianum, will be equally demonstrated to those who suppose that it is recent and foreign, appearing no earlier than yesterday. This is an admission, by the way, that not only is this religion new, it is only now finding a name. By this means, by what he's about to do, moreover, the real antiquity and divine character of Christianity will be equally demonstrated to those who suppose that it is recent and foreign, appearing no earlier than yesterday. In other words, there are people saying, this is a brand new religion. What are you talking about? This, isn't, this, this religion has never existed before. They don't, they don't even have a, a, an official name for it. That's what's going on. And he's saying, look, I'm going to prove them wrong. And in doing so, he's admitted that it is new. Then, there's some other really interesting things before I get on to the next thing I'm going to say. But uh, one of the things that he does is he calls Yeshua a demiurge. Yeah, I've got the word, uh, I made a little square around it and highlighted it in yellow. Called him a demiurge. That's a half man, half God, by the way. Then he says that uh, there's two gods. And he talks about how the two gods together created everything, the God the Father and God the Son created everything and then there's things that are just so un ridiculous you can't even talk about it he believed one of the places says oh lord that judges all the earth Wilt thou not do judgment? For inasmuch as no reason would allow that the uncreated and unchangeable substance of the Almighty was converted into the form of man. So he's saying it is impossible for God to be seen in human flesh. That's what Eusebius said. It's impossible. So then he goes on, the Father God is the first Lord and Jesus is the second Lord. He set forth his logos and healed them, and he rescued them from their corruptions. Actually, I think I'm reading behind where it says that. Um, anyway, it's not really what I'm trying to get to. There's some interesting things here. There's no mention of the church starting on the day of Shavuot. This is the official church history, and it never mentions the day of Pentecost. That's huge, because it tells us that that's a more modern idea. He never refers to the Ecclesia as the saints. And in the first century, they were called the Hasidim, the saints. And he never refers to this group of people as the Hasidim. He never refers to the Trinity, not one time. This is your church historian. He says that Sophia is the first uh, person that God uh, was the first begotten of God, Sophia. This woman, Sophia, was the first begotten of God, and she was the mother of Yahweh. 
the creator of the heavens and the earth. This stuff is some crazy stuff. Then, let's get a little more clear when I get to this one, yeah. Oop, I'm the wrong one. I'm getting there. <laughs> trying to find it. Then he says, um, but even if we are clearly new, and it wasn't clear before that they're a new religion, but even if we are clearly new, and this really fresh name of Christian, Christiana, this really fresh name, this brand new name Christian is recently known among all nations. Nevertheless, our life and method of conduct is in accordance with the precepts of religion, has not been recently invented by us. So he's saying that you can't really call us new because we live according to the Bible. So we're not new, even though we're brand new and we're just now coming up with this word Christian. <laughs> it's incredible to me that people still haven't figured this out. And then he goes on after he says this and gives a little bit of more argument about it. Then he goes on and says, um, If the line be traced back from Abraham to the first man, so he's going backwards from Abraham to Adam. If, there, if the line be traced from that point, anyone who should describe those who have obtained a good testimony for righteousness as the Christianon, or Christianos in this case, in fact, if not in name, would not shoot wide of the truth. <laughs> so it's not true, but it's not far from the truth. So that makes it the truth, right? Does that sound like our government today? Over and over, he tells you, the church historian tells you that the church is brand new. Written right around 329 A.D. Picking back up with verse 4. And when they arrived in Yerushalayim, remember this is Shaul and Barnabas. They're on their way to Yerushalayim. They've been ordered to go back and uh, submit themselves to the authority that is above them. Yes, they had authority above them. They're on their way back. And arriving in Yerushalayim, they, they were received of the Adah, of the congregation, and the Shelichim and the Zikne, the apostles and the elders, declaring many things that God had done with them. But there arose certain of the sect of Perishim, of the Pharisees, who were Torah observant. Now, they were Torah observant Pharisees, saying that it was necessary to circumcise them commanding them to observe the Torah of Moshe. The Torah of Moshe, that's the Torah. Because Moshe is the one credited with writing it. He wrote the law. Verse 6, So the Shelihim, so the apostles, and the Zitne, the elders, gathered together to see about the matter. And after many arguments, Kepa, that's Peter, rose up and said to them, Men, Torah observant ones, brothers, you know that from... Some time ago, God chose among us that by my mouth, the going, the Gentiles, should hear the word of the message. They say of the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the message that Mashiach has restored God's covenant. And he's saying, just not too terribly long ago, he was on the house of uh, Simon the Tanner. It was Simon, right? Shimon the Tanner. This is a guy that takes dog poop and uses it to tan hides. So now you know why he was on top of the house. Just saying. So he's on top of the house. Somebody comes and knocks and says, hey, uh, we're Gentiles. Will you come tell us what the gospel is? So he's, he's referring to this event. 
should hear the message of the Mashiach has restored God's covenant and the gospel and be to our observant, be faithful. Anyone can hear the word of God and believe it, but believing the word of God does nothing to or for anyone. The concept of believing and therefore receiving comes from fairy tales, not the Bible. During the biblical period, when people heard the gospel, they become faithful or became faithful to it. In other words, they began to learn and live according to the Torah. So to believe, or more correctly, to be faithful was to live according to the Torah. Verse 8, And God which knows the hearts, bear witness of them, giving them the Holy Spirit, the Holy Torah, even as also us. Because up until that moment, only the Jews had the law and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts through Torah observance, through faithfulness. So, wow. I don't know if you caught that, but we are not purified when we believe the gospel message. We are purified by the process of learning the Torah. This is incredibly important for everyone to completely understand. When we give our hearts to God and agree to enter into a covenant with him, we do not become spotless and pure. It is the blood of the sacrifice of the lamb, of the flesh of God that covers us while we are on our journey to perfection, which is a journey to learning and applying the Torah to our lives. Now verse 10, now then, why tempt God putting a yoke upon the neck of the Talmudim which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear. And so here, see there, they don't have to be circumcised. But wait a minute. Kepa is not saying they should not be circumcised, given that every Jew present that day was in fact circumcised. Listen to what it said. Now, why Tim God putting a yoke upon the neck of the Talmudim, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? Obviously, they can bear circumcision. They all were circumcised. He is saying that they don't need to be circumcised before they come in. Verse 11. But by the grace of Yahweh, Yeshua, we shall be saved even as they. To the biblical Yehudim, to the biblical Jews, salvation was for here and now. You don't need to be saved in heaven. You need to be saved here. And, and it only came to those who lived according to the Torah, because the Torah, living by Torah, that is salvation. Thus the Perashim felt that since the Goim were not circumcised as according to the Torah, they were not saved. In other words, they were not Torah observant. Salvation and Torah observant are the same thing. Kepa's argument was that as long as we are learning and striving to live according to our covenant, in other words, according to the laws contained within the Torah, we have the grace of Yahweh Yeshua, which covers us over with his blood, even though we all fall short. Confused yet? Let me put it this way. God's grace covers the sin we commit inadvertently. It covers the sin we commit through ignorance of his Torah, it covers the sin we commit through our disobedience to his commands while we are still having trouble letting go of something or giving into his will. I'm speaking of, of the converts here. For men to come along and claim that there is no salvation unless and until we do something or stop doing something is to diminish the grace of God and to lay heavy burdens which no man is able to endure. So Kepa's argument was, you are picking one Torah rebellion, one sin, as a reason not to allow the Goim into the synagogues. That's what's going on here. Until they have complied, but we all know that he probably could have named ten Torah rebellions, ten sins of each of the men who were complaining. There was probably a few of them there overweight. That's gluttony. Might have been one or two that were heavy drinkers. That's drinking to excess. Might have been one or two that slapped their wives around. That's against God's law. Might have been one or two or all of them that were liars to some level and some degree. Why are they allowed into the synagogue? 
and these people are being kept over kept out over one non-compliant thing. It was astounding what he just said. Let him that is without sin cast the first stone. Then all the crowd became silent and received Barnab and Shaul, declaring the great miracles and wonders God did among the going by them. And afterwards they kept their silence. Yaakov responded, saying, Men, to our observant ones, that's the brothers, hear me. Shimon has made known how that at the beginning God visited and took from the Goim, from the Gentiles, a people by his authority. And this agrees with the word of the Nevi'im, the word of the prophets, as it is written. And now he's going to quote them. And in that day I will raise up the Hehal, that's the temple of David, that fell, and I will close up the breaches and raise up its ruins, and I will build it as the days of old. That came right out of Amos 9.11. Then it goes on, he's still quoting, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom, and upon all the going Gentiles, which are called by my authority, do you hear it? Says Yahweh, who does this? Amos 9.12. Verse 18. Known from the world. This is a Hebrew idiom. Known from the world is a Hebrew idiom. Put another way. These things have been known from the beginning of the world. It was spoken by the Nevi'im, by the prophets, which means it was the plan of God before he began the creation process. In other words, it's nothing new. They, they, they knew all along that the day would come when God would pull in the Gentiles. All along. Verse 19. Therefore my judgment is, do not trouble these from among the going who are converting to Judaism. Don't trouble the Gentiles who are converting to Judaism. Yours is turning to God. What do you think that is? It's the way the Hebrews say converting to Judaism. Verse 20. But we should write to them, the ones converting, that they, here's the first one, abstain from the defilement of idols. In other words, that they don't bow their hearts and their bodies to idols. So if you're in the conversion process, the first thing we want you to know is don't bow yourself or your heart to an idol. Don't let something become more important to you than God himself. If you're missing service because you're taking your children to some sporting event, you're bowing down to an idol. It's that simple. You're literally teaching your children that there's, there are things more important than God himself. This is a terrible thing for someone converting to Judaism to be doing. So don't be doing that. And the second one he said is abstain from unfaithfulness. Don't stop, a living, don't stop living according to the Torah. You don't just pick and choose. You don't live for, for God on, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and forget Thursdays and Fridays. No, you don't stop. You do it at all times. So what do you do when you fail? The Torah tells you what to do. Go back to the Torah. If you don't understand it yet, go to your rabbi and let him show you what the Torah says. Let him tell you how to get back on the... Don't stop. Don't say, oh, I, I messed up. I might as well quit. No. Keep going. First, you don't bow down to idols. Next, you got to keep going. Three, abstain from being strangled. This is an important one. I might have put this one first if it had been me. It means don't be overwhelmed by all this new stuff. Take it easy. You'll get it eventually. And there's a good example of this, the usage of this idiom in Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, 15. Look it up if you like. Verse, uh, or the fourth one, we're still in the same verse, but the fourth thing that he said was, and abstain from blood. What does that mean? It's a Hebrew idiom, people. Live according to the laws of purity. That's what abstain from blood means. It's an idiom. Live according to the laws of purity. In other words, if you're in the conversion process, stop eating pork. Stop eating shrimp. Stop eating gumbo. Stop eating catfish. Stop eating the unclean stuff because you're supposed to live according to the laws of purity. Are you with me? I'm just saying. Now, in verse 21, he gives... The fifth thing, 
see it. I've heard people say there's four necessary things. No, there's five. Because in verse 21, here's the fifth one. For Moshe from ancient times has those in the cities who preach him. There are people in the cities who teach Torah. It says being read, that's the Torah, in the Adah, that's the synagogue, every Shabbat, that's every Saturday. That's the fifth thing. It should be clear from verses 20 and 21 that there are five basic things that are required of the Gentiles who wish to become Jews, who wish to turn to God. Moshe is preached. This is clearly a mandate to learn the Torah and to show up at the synagogue every Shabbat. Gentile converts to Judaism were, were required to attend the synagogue every Saturday. This was so that they could learn the laws of the Torah and how to apply them to their daily lives. Remember, the argument wasn't whether a man should be circumcised or not. It was whether a man should be considered a brother, a Jew, without circumcision. In other words, at what point is the person a Jew? In the end, it was agreed by the Shilohim, by the apostles, and the Zikne, the elders, who actually followed Yeshua. These are the apostles and elders who followed Yeshua, the guy they called Jesus, the guy the yapping chihuahuas called Jesus. Those people. Uh, they said that a brother, that a person is a Jew, the moment he or she turns from sin and begins the process of learning and applying the Torah to his or her life. It's not upon completion. It's, a, it's upon the turning. In case you forgot my question, because <laughs> there was a question, remember? It was, so do Christians have to become Jews? In other words, do the Gentiles have to convert to Judaism? Yes, yes, yes. And did I mention yes? Not only did the Shelechim, the apostles, lay out four basic things that the yapping little chihuahuas had to follow in order to be considered brothers, they then, the apostles, told the yapping little chihuahuas that they would learn the rest of what they needed to know from participating in the Saturday morning synagogue service, which are taught by the doctors of the law, not by televangelists and preachers of Christianity. If we are grafted into the covenant that God made with the children of Israel, then we must live by the rules of that covenant. Otherwise, we have no covenant with God. And without a covenant with God, we are nothing more than yapping little chihuahuas who receive nothing, not even table scraps, since we won't be anywhere near the right table. God only entered into one covenant. It was not with the yapping little chihuahuas. It was with Israel. Did you know that Yisrael means soldier of God? Are you grafted into God's army? Are you obeying your superior officer's commands? Yochanan, that's John chapter 14, verse 15 says, If you love me, this is Yeshua talking, If you love me, obey my mitzvot. This is El Remez to the following verses. And I'm going to name them all. Exodus chapter 20, verse 6. Leviticus chapter 22 verse 31 and chapter 26 verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 10 and chapter 5 verse 29. 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 14, chapter 6 verse 12, chapter 11 verse 38, and 2 Kings chapter 17 verse 13. Now here's an example. It comes from Exodus chapter 20 verse 6. It says, And working mercy to the thousands who love me, that's Yahweh speaking, and obey my, Yahweh's, mitzvot. Yeshua has just declared that he is a physical manifestation of Yahweh God. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Yeshua is God in the flesh, not some Navi, not some prophet who lived well. His mitzvot, his commandments, his laws were given at Sinai, not in the New Testament. If the lost sheep are those who know the Torah and don't live by it, 
then the righteous are those who know the Torah and choose to live by it. I once spoke with a girl who told me that she no longer went to church. She no longer paid tithe and offering. She had not studied her Bible in years. And in the same conversation, she told me that she had a better, more intimate relationship with God now than ever before. She went on to say that God was completely happy with the way things were going in her life. When I told her that she was living her life in rebellion against God, she told me that she could no longer talk to me or be my friend. I don't understand why she got so mad. I, I don't get it. Was it something I said? <laughs> Man, if she didn't like that, if she didn't like what I said, I'm not sure what she would have said had I told her what I was really thinking at the time. Over a period of three or four years, I tried to introduce her to an intimate relationship with Yahweh, king of all that exists. But what she did was take the mushy love, love, love stuff and apply it to the little golden cow that she had created in her own mind. A God who requires nothing of her but her adoration and love. Nothing but that which she was willing to give. Have you ever served that God? Are you still? Are you a yapping little chihuahua? Or are you grafted into the covenant with Israel? and fully adopted as his child? Are you living on occasional table scraps, or are you sitting at the table? It comes down to this. Are you serving a God who fits into your lifestyle, or does your lifestyle reflect obedience to the covenant God made with Israel? Babbling at the right table may get us occasional crumbs, but only obedience can make us family. Shalom, be shalom.